Hello everyone. Welcome to the session four of uh, the labs. So in this lab, uh, I would recommend each and every one of you to go through the lecture slides uh, for all the lecture slides discussed for design compiler, that means complete unit three, and all the three labs. You should be very very comfortable at the end of lab three. Uh, before beginning lab four, <coughs> lab four, I discuss about uh, some miscellaneous items about the different formats that you could write out and how you could read in with those formats uh, of design. And then I would discuss about some advanced concepts in synthesis. Uh, I would uh, take up one more example of a design. And I would uh, clarify what virtual blocks are, what are the math delays. So, since these are somewhat advanced topics, I would uh, recommend that you be very comfortable in lab 3. So you should understand everything that is discussed in lab 3 before going on to lab 3. So, uh, just clarifying one thing uh, before starting is that I am using one alias uh, called LT. LT is not a unique command. So, I have uh, put this in, in my source file uh, alias and I use this. Uh, so, LT is an alias for LS kind of analogy. Uh, this is what I use for uh, listing down the files in order of uh, time um, modified. Uh, so, yeah, you could choose to use a different sort of LT command or something like that, uh, different sort of LS command. Uh, so, please do not be confused, LT is not a unique command, just an alias, right. <laughs> so, let us go to the so this this time I am not using uh, the design I have been using for the first three sessions. I will be using some of different design. Uh, so I have copied the RTL again and I will be working in work directly. So this is the design uh, and uh, this is the hierarchy of the design. So the top level is called chip level. It has a 16 cross 16 multiplier, 8 cross 8 multiplier. It has a MUX module, it has then a cascade module has a couple of 8 bit adders, a comparator, a counter, then it has a 16 bit adder, again there is a comparator at the top level. So, this is not a real world design, it is just a, a bunch of data path components assembled together to give, uh, to help us in understanding some of the concepts. So, uh, you could look at the RTL files, they are very, very simple comparatively. Um, uh, this is the, uh, these are the bunch of RTL files used. So, adder 16 is just, uh, uh, so adder 16 is nothing but <laughs> it is, it, uh, it just registers the input, I mean, uh, it just adds the 8 bit, the 8 bit register, uh, uh, sorry, 16 bit register. So, in, uh, a and B and are uh, the two uh, 16 bit inputs. Uh, so, uh, the carry out and sum is just in uh, plus B in plus carry in. Carry in is also one of the inputs. So, um, most of the modules are of this kind where adder 16, adder 8, multiply 8 cross 8, multiply 16 plus 16. Uh, let's go to the work directory. Uh, so what uh, I did, I have I've written out a bunch of VDCs and, and, and log files. Uh, I've, I've tried two, three, four different types of synthesis. Uh, yeah. So I've already synthesized them uh, to save on time <laughs> and to show you quickly what I want want to be shown. So uh, <laughs> let's first discuss the difference between writing out DDC and writing out the log file. So let let me open this. Now, the write command supports uh, multiple formats. Two of the most formats, most famous formats are DDC and the block. DDC <coughs> is the uh, synopsis internal format, internal binary format, and it is recommended to be, to be used if you are using synopsis tools further down in the design flow. However, uh, if you are using any third party tool uh, for backend, they will not be reading DDC, so you would be in a very long time. But there is one major difference between DDC and one of five is that DDC contains the constraint function, not simply uh, the design information, but also the constraint. So what I'll do, I'll read in uh, the DDC of uh, 
one of the flavors of synthesis yeah. as the name suggests yeah. so i am reading in the ddc of no i would delete dot ddc this is the synthesis i have performed yeah. so yeah now see uh, i read in the ddc but now what has happened is that it read in the ddc file but it did not find the library why because i haven't set the link uh, link library in a target library so what i would do is i would start again i would remove the design so this is to show you that you should first have all the variables set and then uh, you should read in the design so i'll set in the uh, the important variables these are the important uh, four commands uh, so i've set all of them now i'll again uh, read this ddc and now so the, when we read in ddc you should you should always uh, when you read it some design some some design design <laughs> or even not here you should always make sure that your uh, top level is set correctly so the, it tells me here that uh, this current design is tip level and you could also verify that the current design is in fact in the, the top level design is tip level now the next step so when we read in the rtl complete rtl using analyze command we should do elaborate on the top level design what does elaborate do elaborate converts the rtl into gtl but here it is not rtl it is already in at list it is already in gate level form so you would not use elaborate but we will use a command called link link will just make sure that all the components in your design are mapped and all the libraries that you have loaded and all the components are in fact linked to one library or the other so here it tells me that the memory has 12 design and uh, this is the ddc that we have read and this is the library right so this linking is is okay earlier it it complained that cannot specify a library because ddc contains a link to that library and since the target uh, library and link library were not set so it gave it error <laughs> so uh, now uh, this is already synthesized design now let's look at so it also has constraints because it's a ddc it's not very long right when we write out ddc the constraints are also written out so it also it already has a clock which is uh, a clock of 2 nanoseconds created on the code clk and it already it does not have any input output delay uh, although it does have a uh, uh, so i do a report code minus the report so it does is <laughs> it does not have input output delay what it has it has loads on the output which is 10 it has uh, so there is no input delay the input delay is very very empty the output delay is also empty it has transition so uh, it has a transition of 0.5 on inputs so uh, i have just uh, defined the environment constraints but no io delay now i i synthesize it without the io delay with just the clock delay Uh, so these are the constraints file i is the constraint i i set the operating condition i set the input transition i set the load i created the clock i set the clock uncertainty transition and i just did the compiling the standard options now synthesis is done i wrote out the ddc i read in the ddc again now if you would have read out uh, read the the very log then only the design would have been in the place you would have to reapply the constraint so what we could also do is we can write out the constraint by using something called write script so if you see the help the write script uh, let's uh, so write script also supports different formats so what we we'll do we say write script so our most famous format is for db so the most designed constraint or there's also a dc tcl which is the dc typical format so i use the uh, dc typical format so uh, and i write uh, dot dot typical let's see what it writes uh, minus output let's open this dot dot typical so it uh, wrote the units operating condition link library 
pin load. Now see the single command will issue set load uh, on all outputs of the value of 10. It translates into so many set load commands on each of these source and it contains the clock uh, information, input transition and so on right. So this is the constraint that <laughs> DC wrote out for you. Now so there are two choices either I read in the so I want to read the synthesized design either I should have a DDC or I should have a web log and a constraint right or the original constraints in ticket format like this something like this. So uh, usually when I want to deliver this constraint to the backend for place and route, I would give the well log plus this kind of a constraint. Now let's go back to design compiler. Now the design is already ready. I want to show you the uh, the report the constraints report. Right? So I've already written out that uh, so there is a so with this uh, particular DDC. Uh, let's first look at how to write out these reports. Right? Now let's look at some report timing example. Now first let's look at what are the constraints that are violated. So report constraint minus all violated will give you that is the minus most reduction. So this was the this is, these are the only violations in the design. All all of them are hold. As I've discussed before, do not worry much about the hold violations, the small hold violations in things like They are expected and it is expected that we should not solve them in simple. They are better solved after the place and route is done, after there is some property in place. I will come to that later in minute five. So there is no no set up position. All the uh, but the fact is that there are no input and output delays. Right? The only delay, the only constraint part are the register to register part. So if I do a report timing, report timing by default will report the worst case <laughs> violator for each path group. Now there since there is only one clock, there is just one clock group which is clock, which is the group and it will tell me what is the worst path. Right? So I give this. Now it is telling me that this is the worst path. Start point is the register and then the register. I will not discuss the report timing format again. Uh, please refer to the last lab if you haven't understood it clearly. It uh, tells the complete path and then we see that there is no volition, it is not Slack is not. And it is meeting by zero. That means it is barely met. Right. Now there is one thing called critical range. What it means is that let uh, The command is called set critical range. It has these many options. Now, what happens is that DC will optimize, and we have seen that it uses multiple iterations to do design with system and do timing optimization. Now, by default, when you do not do anything special, when you do not issue any special command, DC will try and fix from the worst paths that are violated. Now, if your design is relaxed, so and it will then do area recovery. So it will focus its energy on the worst volatiles for which the slack is less than zero. Now, for some reason, let's say you are doing some trial principle and you want so now in this case you see that slack is actually zero, right? Now some people for some special cases may want that no, I do not want a zero slack. I want some margin. I want the slack to be positive at 100 feet per second or 0.5 nanosecond or something like that. You can use set critical range to control that. This is again an advanced feature used for very, very specific cases. So, what it does is that you could use, you could specify a case, specify the values to which critical range attribute is to be set, and you can say what designs it should be set on. So the compile command will use this attribute of the top level design as a default critical range for the path tools that do not have this set. By default, the value is zero. That means it will fix the zero. 
we can assign this critical range uh, using this critical range command there is also can be used in, in group path and we can assign a positive floating point value greater than 0.0, .0 right greater than 0 and then uh, so a critical range of 0 means only the most critical parts are optimized if we specify a non zero value that then the near critical path within that amount will also be optimized if possible. So, you could say that you could set the critical range to be 10, uh, 10 ps for example. So, DC will try and optimize till 10 ps all those paths that have slack between 0 and 10 ps. So, this is a uh, you could try it out uh, if time permits then maybe in the next session you can try one example of this, but it is again a very special use case uh, if you will not encounter its usage very frequently. So, now what happens to the input and output form? So, we reported parts. Uh, so, we, we saw that only uh, there are only gold volitions as a set of volitions, but uh, so how to report the path starting from input? Reverse path, you could say something like this report timing from on input. Now, it tells us that it gives us the reverse path again. Start point, input port, end point is a register which is clock by clock, but the path group is none. Why the path group is none? Because there is no input delay. Although the input delay is assumed to be 0, input delay is assumed to be 0, but DC does not know that what clock it cannot choose any default clock. So, <laughs> Because uh, since generally whenever we specify input or output delay, we should also tell which clock is it referring to, and there is no input delay defined. DC assumes a value of zero; it cannot assume anything else, but it doesn't know what clock it is on. So it will just uh, say that it will just say that path is unconstrained because there is no target time to which this data should arrive. And please note that uh, so it it uh, uh, it. There are a lot of full adders in the design which is going through a multiplier. So, uh, the path uh, two important things path group will be none and path will be unconstrained if you do not specify any input delay, right. Similarly, to outputs, how to report timing to outputs? We say report timing minus 2 on outputs. Now, we see again path is starting from register. Is going to the endpoint output port and path is again unconstrained. Now, here DC does not even tell you that there is an output delay because again the output delay forms the part of the data required time. So, there are two sections if you remember correctly data uh, arrival time and data required time. Output delay forms the part of the data required, required time which is not here, not present here because there is no required time, there is no constraint. Input delay forms the part of the data launch path. So, it assumes a 0, right. So, uh, these are unconstrained, unconstrained. Now, DC here is free to reclaim area. If it reclaims area, in that case, the path will be very slow, right. So, let us see what is the area. So, let us okay, there is some area, uh, total cell area is 5 to 0 5. Now, uh, is it good, is it bad not to have an input and output delay? Let us see. Now, one more example of report timing. Now, I want to report timing, report the worst case path from starting from a register and into a register. I want to report the worst case path among all register to register path. In this case, it is easy because input and output delays are not specified. I can just do before timing, and the worst case part that comes is in fact a register register path. Why? Because there is no input, all the input parts are unconstrained, all the output parts are unconstrained. Report timing by default will report, you have to remember this, it will report worst part in each clock group, worst single part. If you want to so, if you want to report multiple parts, you can say n minus max parts, let us say 5. It will now give us 5 worst parts, right. All of them, so these are the 5 worst parts, right. Now, I have a second version of this design where I have done this. 
I have specified an input delay of one on all inputs and an output delay of one on all inputs. Right. One more type of path could be there, starting from input, ending in input, and output input report again. Uh, report timing minus from on inputs minus two on output. So these are these type of paths are completely combination paths. For example, it is going from a cell zero to mask out. We see that again input external delay is assumed to be zero, but the path would be unconstrained, right? So this is one more example. So we saw that input register is unconstrained, register register is fine, register to output is unconstrained, input to output is unconstrained. Right? Now I will remove this design and I will read in the DDC of the design with input delay, input and output. So I will say remove design minus design. I do not want to remove the language, so I will not do all. Then I will read in the DDC. What is the DDC selling? DDC will I utilize dot DDC? Again, current design is correctly set. I will just do a link. It's fine. Then now I want to do report time. Right? Now let's see the report constraint first. So it gives you a message that it is updating design, updating graph, updating graphing, it is updating time. So it has the design info, it has the constraints, it just needs to do a little process under its foot to calculate the timing and to give you all this graph. Now this is the problem. Now there are set of collisions. These are the endpoints. So we see that okay, there are some Outputs on which there are violations. These might be input register path, register register path. We do not know since only input is listed. So now there are a lot of violations, right? And plus the whole violations compared to the one where we gave it to the output rate. Now let's analyze where these violations lie. First, I want to check what are the violations from the inputs. So again, I will report any from all. Now this is a violation. This is the worst part from the input group. Now I see that okay, input delay is one. Um, DC did some optimization. Now if you remember the uh, <laughs> the earlier part where there was no input delay set, the input to register pass was very very long. The worst case part was about uh, it was about three nanoseconds. Now here DC has done some optimization because there was some constraint. And since there is a violation, we know that DC has worked here, right? It has optimized. Now we see, we don't see, do not see so many levels of logic. You could go and compare the uh, the timing of input register path in this DDC, and without the IO delay DDC, you would find that the paths are much more optimized here because there is a constraint. So DC can only only optimize when there is a constraint component. So okay, there is there is violation from input to register path. I know I have uh, the the frequency is very very fast. This is like 500 megahertz. The input here is not registered. Input is going through so many so many levels of formalism logic to the register. So with this, I know that the design is not good, right? It's not a real world design. The input all the inputs should have been registered. There should be a flop right after the input. There should not be any combination logic. In that case, it would meet our requirement. It would meet the input external delay of nanosecond. It can even meet 1.8 nanosecond. So the design is very simple. What I want you to do is, as an assignment, try and correct, correct the design so that the input to register paths are good, good for timing. How do you do that? You register all inputs. Similarly, I want to see the output time. Report, I will say report timing minus from all inputs minus to all output. Oh, sorry, I will just do more first minus to all output. So, this is again a uh, what, what it gave us the worst case part. Ending at the output is in fact starting from the input itself. <coughs> you know, this is why it's worse. Too. The output delay is one, the input delay is one. So you are left with zero path class, zero 
available time, right? So clock sequence is two. Out of the clock, out of the total period of two nanoseconds, you gave one nanosecond on the input side, one nanosecond on the output side. There is nothing left for the operation you want to do inside, right? So in this case also, I want to. So what we could do is, for such cases, I'll come to this later, a slide later. But for such cases, we have to make sure that our input delays and output delays are not in such a way that such kind of combination parts are constrained like this. It is a very bad constraint because it doesn't leave anything for the internal design. Right? It will give all the timing away at either input side or the output side. So, practical solution would be to reduce the input delay or the output delay. There is one more solution, I will come to that later. So, uh, now uh, I want I want to report the worst case register to register form. Let us do a report timing and see what it does. Now, report timing tells us that the worst path is from start point to the end point register, start point to the port, clock group is clock. Now, for all the paths in this design, the clock group is clock. Whether it be input to output, input to register, register to register, register to output. Now, what is the way to report simply register to register time? What you could do, you could use a, use a command called all register. Now, all register typically gives you a list of all register, but it has few options called all registers minus data pins to return a collection with, with all the data pins of the register minus clock pin will return with all the clock pins of all the registers. So now I know that in case of a register to register path, the start point is the clock pin of the register. So I do all register minus clock pin and the end point is any data pin. So for register to register path the start point is always the clock. So I Build up a collection of all the clock pins of all the registers. Here I have the collection of all the data pins of all the registers. Right? If I do this, it will tell me the worst case register to register path. So this is the path. <laughs> Some uh, U7 big data is to U7 result, right? Now let's see. Violation. Now, in the earlier design, now what we have changed? We compare two designs without input delays. Without IO delay and with IO delay. Now, what we have changed is just we have just applied input and output delay. We are just playing with input and output delay value. But do we expect a register to register bit work? No, we did not expect that, right? It is wrong. It is something, so there is some mistake we have done. So that the slack is violated in case of register to register. Ideally, input to register path, register to output path. You can play with the delay values. You can even make sure that your design, your force register, make sure that constraints are good and so on. But the register to register paths typically are the limiting factor for your performance, not the input to register path or output to register, register to output path. The IO delay, IO paths should not be timing critical. What is timing critical usually is the register to register path. Now imagine a in right, of the CPU, lot of arithmetic and logic operations go inside ALU. Typically, the core of the ALU, which arithmetic operations, would be time critical. Right? Not the incoming ports to register or register to output. Right? Now, what is the problem? Why did DC not optimize this part? We know that DC can optimize. Why? Because we have seen in the earlier example that without input output delays, without applying input output delays. DC was, was able to achieve a zero slack, but in this case it is not so. Why? Now the problem is that DC works on groups. Here there is only one clock group, that is clock. So DC will group the all the timing paths into different groups which are determined by the clock. Now in this case the core works on the same clock. The input delays are on the same clock, the output delays are on the same clock. DC does not have a way of knowing that whether you want to prioritize the to edge or you want to prioritize register to input to register or you want to prioritize register to output. So it works on all the paths together. What it does now is that let us see the post constraint again. It 
it's a very important thing. Please make sure that you understand it. Understand this concept. Now, in this case, we know that these stock volatiles are into the risk performance. So it will work on all the volatiles, but now it sees that it cannot optimize into the register part anymore. Into the register part is optimized to the maximum, and it has so many volitions. Again, register to output parts have so many volitions, right? So what it does is that it spends all its time and energy into those top volatile parts. If there was only one path volating, then fine, it will come to the second path. But if there are Multiple paths violating at the top, at the top of the group, it will focus its energy on that. Now, it knows that it cannot fix these, so it will leave out some of the rest of the path. It will not optimize it. Why? Because every synthesis process is a time, it has some time limit, right? Over it. Although this is a very small, small design and all that, but still, <coughs> so. B, since all the parts in the same are in the same group, same clock group, and DC does not know any priority, it assumes that all parts are of same priority. It will optimize, and since it sees so many volitions at the top level, starting from inputs or going to output, it will spend all its time and energy in solving this. And in the process, it will leave, it might leave out some of the resistance in the power. So, what do we do to solve this? We do not want this to be. Now there is a much more sophisticated technique which you should I I recommend that you use this technique always what I am about to tell you. Now what I do is I remove this design. Now what I what extra thing I do is that I use a command called group plan. So what I do is that so the first uh, design we saw did not have any input delays how to delay. Second level of design had input output delay, and we saw that it created problems in this direct path. Now I'll do a group path. I issue a command for group path. I add group. I create a new group called input group, and I say that all the paths starting from input put it into this group. Again, I tell that all the paths ending at the output port keep it into an output group. Now I'll read in the DDC in this object to test code. So I read in the DDC in which I have the group path command of my I do a link and again I do a report function minus all validators. Now we see that there are volitions. So now it has three groups: clock, input group, and output group. The two of the groups we have created explicitly. So now it tells us per group. So maximum setup is volatile in input group. It is expected fine because in only it is also is volatile. <laughs> then these are all input group volitions. Now it is very tricky. now reporting part also becomes much more better. Now we know that intuitively we know that okay input group means all these endpoints the volition is starting from some input port right then that's it there are no volitions no set of volitions in the clock group clock or there are no volitions in output group also now let's do a little time. now this report timing Will report worst volatiles, worst case path, not the volatiles. If it will not be, if all the paths are not volating, all the timing is met, it will again report the path with the worst plan. So it could be negative plan or positive plan. So now the first part it reports is the path group clock from register to register. Now the path group clock in fact contains only register to register path because we have created separate groups for input and output. So now this path. Is met. So we are back to good synthesis data. We saw in trial one that without input output delay, DP is able to meet timing. In second trial, we saw that the timing was bad. Now in this one, we are able to restore the timing. Right? 
I'll tell you why. How did we achieve that by group part? Now Slack is meant. Now report timing will also report the part that timing, the first timing for input group and output group. So the second part it reports is the input group. We know that timing is volating here because it's a, it's a long part. There is a volation. Now it reports the output group. Right? Output group is also meeting. We saw that there is new volatility that we can show here or what? Now, how did DC achieve this? DC was able to achieve this because now it sees three groups. Earlier, it's only one group. So now, as many groups as DC sees, it will try to meet the timing for each of those groups individually. So it tries to meet timing for clock. Now, the clock has no competition with input group. Right? Clock is a is a group in itself. All register to register path. So it will time. It will try and meet timing, and we saw that it is able to meet timing. Now it works on input group. Now input groups group it finds that okay, yes. Uh, uh, let's do a report and string. So input group now input group timing path is critical now because it's a long. There's a lot of complicated model to do input in the first position. So it tries to optimize. Now it might happen that the path lower down here can be optimized. But they are not optimized because there are number of paths that are volatile more than these paths, right? So it can happen in the same group. The paths with the top volatile can prevent optimization of the paths that are volatile by a smaller amount. It can happen. We saw that in trial two, right? Again, output group. So we saw that in the earlier case, in the last trial, the output group was the 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 timing to output was also volatile, but now it's not volatile here, right? So DC will work on every group. So it's a very good practice to create separate groups for input and output, right? Either in this way, or the things will change when multiple clock, clocks will come into account, right? So the best practice is to register all inputs and outputs so that the timing constraints become very very easy. Second, if you realize that your register to register timing is volatile, look at other groups. And you expect the timing to pass. Look at the other groups. What does the other group want? Make sure that you segregate groups. So things become much more complex when you have multiple clocks. Then you have to make sure that the inputs get into delay with respect to the correct clock, not to the wrong clock. Or you could use the group path to uh, create separate groups of your own, right? <laughs> read more about group path. Read more about the non page in the in the non page. Group path is one more functionality. Group path, in fact, provides you with a lot of things. So let's look at group path one more. So in fact, you could also set a date. In fact, so what you could do is <laughs> you have separate groups. You have separate groups created. Now you can tell DC that. This group has higher priority, so that DC will spend more time on that, more time and energy, right? By by changing the weight value, if you create a group without specifying anything to the weight and the physical weight, then for DC all the groups are equal, and it will meet up to the critical range of zero. But you could tell DC that I want to want this this group is more important, so please spend more time in this, so I can use this weight feature. You can read more about it and try. Maybe in the next uh, lab session, I will try out the weight feature, but not in this one. I just wanted to introduce the concept of path grouping and to make sure that you understand how DC optimizes in a particular group and how the top volatiles in one group can affect the optimization on the path that are volatile by a smaller amount. Right? I hope the concept is clear. Now. Uh, now let's see a few other things. So we have discussed we discussed about the the uh, IO delays. Uh, what how how does IO delay applying or not applying IO delay will affect your design? We saw discussed about the write command and the read read back of BDC and all that. We have discussed about group path. Now let's see a command called change names. <laughs> now <coughs> for this particular design. 
let me write out a so I have written out a very long one. Let, let's look at the value. Uh, now let's look at the let, let's look at the very long of uh, no IO delays uh, not B. Right. Now uh, if you notice there are backslash in the name of wires. And probably this this wire was 16 bit wide, and it is split like this backslash the wire name and slash and n16 and so on. We saw that we see that the instance names have backslashes and so on. This is the way design compiler operates when it works on a design, and we wrote out well enough so it will write out in the same form. But this netlist will have problems when some third party tools will read it. Why? Because uh, this, this, these do not follow the Verilog rule. The naming convention does not follow the Verilog rules. So, what do we do to correct this? There is a command called uh, change names. Uh, so, what I did was uh, I applied a change names on this. I said change names uh, minus uh, verbose, which will give me a list of these things. And I say minus rules. And I tell DC that follow Verilog rule. And change the names, correct the names, right? If I do this, what happens? Or I will say minus hierarchy. So now it is telling me that in this design, <laughs> this object is a cell and it is changing the name to this, right? So again, see if you see that this instance name slash is removed and the code is added. So it will give you a list of all the names it changing, right? Let's look at the net, for example. For example, see the net is has slash in it, but here it is replaced by underscore. So you could the, the uh, replacement of slash by underscore. These things are configurable. There's a command called define name rule, which you can define a own rule. But uh, for all practical purposes, you can use the name name rule well very well. Do it under complete hierarchy. And now you write out the design. So the design looks like this. So let's look at the chain name design. Now the design looks like this: the the instance names are corrected. There are no backslash or slash in the wire name, and so on. So now it is safe to be to deliver this log to a third party tool. There will not be any problem in reading, right? So ideally, you should include chain names before writing out the log. Right? So this was all about chain names. Now let's look at Something called the DW module. We discussed this in the lecture that DW is short form for design web components. Design web components is a group of uh, uh, data path components by Synopsis itself. Uh, let's look at the design. Uh, there is a data path component in the design. So I think it's in the path that you want to do. Yeah. So here uh, you could use something like this dw 0 to underscore multiple sign for multiply module. The hash eight cross head tail tells that what is the so it multiplies two uh, vectors a and b. We are telling that okay the first is also of eight bits, second is also of eight bits. You should look at the documentation before using any dw components like this. Again, these are this is the this is how it is instantiated. So you could use it directly. Now, second, uh, so what now DC will do is that you do not need a deadlock for this because this DW component DC has the knowledge of this. So, there is a uh, design where we go back to DC shell. Let us go to DC shell again and, and start from start the synthesis from scratch. One more thing. Now let's look at the netlist. Uh, let's look at no idolays dot v and try to find if there is any DW component. Here. There is no DW component here in this netlist. Let's go to path segment because the DW component was here. But here we do not find anything. We do not find any DW component. There is no design by the name of DW here. 
Why? Because by default during the compile, design compiler will ungroup. It will ungroup design where component. You cannot see the uh, actual what is the actual architecture of designer because it's proprietary by the you, you only have the information of what it does and the code information how you should and the rest in the compile process also it will ungroup the hierarchy and you are left with the all the registers or the, the components. Okay, right. How can we avoid that? Let's see. So uh, I'll remove all the design. And now I will read in the RTL. I start from RTL. I will start from RTL. I set up all these things. Oh, sorry. RTL is not there. Now I'll apply the constraint. Let's not apply input output list for to, um, to the thing I want to show you is uh, not depend on output list. Now uh, let's search for a variable which uh, controls the ungroup. So there's a variable called Compile algebra ungroup DW is set to true. It is set to true, let's set it to false. And now let's compile. It is compiling now uh, in the compile log. If you would take the log, it also shows that it is so. If this is the designer building block library, it shows what version it is using. It is inbuilt, so it is using a basic and license both. Uh, so it is mapping now. Now there are two. So it is adding this design where to the list of comparators. So now there are two kinds of users, there are two places where design where is used. One, when you instantiate it explicitly, like in the path segment we did. So it is telling you that it is implementing synthetic means, it is implementing a design where component for path segment. Synthetic library is nothing but a design where library. But when you say A plus B, then also if the designer library is loaded, DC will use one of the designer components. So it will use a DW adder. It is telling us it is implementing synthetic for other 16. It is implementing synthetic for multiply 16 or 16. It is implementing something for counter and uh, for comparator also. So there are a lot of designs already in design where and DC will try and use it as and when possible. <coughs> Since this is done. And there is a command called report resources. You do a report resources minus I can see what it did. It tells us what are the resources that this, this design is using. Now it told us that in part segment dot v, the cell u100 was using dw021 which is explicit with width 8 and and it contains some operations. Right? So, you, so this is explicit. But this adder, this is not explicit. We saw only one DW component in our team. But this one is the this is this one chosen by DC by looking at your RTN. It saw that there was uh, let let we will see the part of it, uh, what is causing this. So DW adder is instantiated by DC. This is the cell with the 16. It contains these operations, right? For each of the design. It will tell, for example, uh, there are no multi uh, multiplexes to report. Now there is one more design. It did not ungroup. In path segment, there was a DW02 underscore 1. It did not ungroup now. 
that is why it is showing a separate design. Now, apart from this explicit one, it uses a lot of other DWs, and none of them is angular because the angular group is set to false. So this is there is one more design. So again, see, multiply 16 plus 16. It uses an unsigned multiplier DW might unsigned, right? And this is the implementation report. It is also telling that for this multiplier, it used this implementation. So AP parts is a is a type of an implementation of a multiplier. Uh, I think double P means partial product. So it is some A. I am not. I do not remember what A means. So it's a partial product based architecture. Somewhere, some somewhere on the line of the boot architecture. It is area. It is optimized for area. So it shows this. Again, uh, we we will see that for multiplier A uh, didn't choose for multiplier A plus A. For now, for multiply 8 plus 8, it also shows the same similar kind of an architecture. Now, for comparator, the comparator is we will see uh, comparator in detail. I have one more example now. So, it shows a component called DW and the right? So, this report resources tells that resources means the DW components or adders or multipliers. It is telling us that what all resources does. The compile command use again for uh, for adder a it used something it, it used a DP of is a DP of a design compile the design of component so and so on right so this this is the complete report you should read this report try to understand what it means uh, read more about the report what it does uh, it, it's not too complex it tells what is the operation and what is the architecture it used. And so on. It also tells it, it, it shared some of the resources. So does it have any? So yeah, it tells there's no resource sharing information. So uh, let me see. If, uh, yeah. So there are uh, three things it uh, reports: resource sharing, implementation, and multiplexes. So it gives, for example, now let's look at. One example and try to map it. Let's look at adder A. So we'll open this file adder A and see that what what it does. Right? This is an adder rate, so it's a very simple thing. But what what is causing DC to use a designer component is this assigned statement. So this assigned statement A plus B plus C. Now this plus sign, these two plus signs will cause DC. So what was the adder rate? Let me go back to Yeah, so adder eight, it used something called DPO. It is kind of an adder, and so this is the data path. So DPO is nothing but a data path operator. Operator. So this data path operator, this is a cell. It contains two operations: at twenty and at twenty-two. Right? It tells us that <laughs> there are three variables because we saw there was a plus b plus c. So there are three primary inputs. And one primary output. All of these are unsigned because by default they are unsigned. The width is 8 here, 8 here, and the carry in is 1. The output will obviously be a 9 bit one. Expression is i1 plus i2 plus i, a plus b plus c. Right? So now let's look at the, so this is the, so it tells what is the implementation. So it shows a DPOP. Now one, one data path operator can have multiple implementations. You can look at the design the documentation to know more. But for example, a multiplier will have a lot, lot of implementations. Some of them will be good for area, others will be good for timing. So this this DPO, DPOP now it is choosing a STR kind of a 
STR, an implementation called STR, which is optimized for ABM. I do not remember what STR means. Uh, uh, let's see the next list now. Uh, we can think what STR means. Uh, now let's look at. Uh, let's write out the. Have I written out the next list? No. Yeah. Yeah. So I have this necklace which is this design with components. Now, now let's look at anything called DW. Now we see that there's the, in multiply eight process. Or let's look at fast segment. Yeah. So this is the module part segment. We see that now that there are <coughs> there is a add zero which is inst which is used by DC. Now it has not ungrouped it, so you can see it in the netlist. A data. So now this the we will compare it with the RTL. So RTL had A plus B plus C, I guess. Look at the RTL also. Now uh, there is the plus sign. So this is a selector block. Multiplier is U hundred, and then uh, is there any adder here? So then multiplier. Yeah. So there is a ALU, which is A data plus B data, and A data and B data are both. 16 bits. So this ALU will. Uh, so there. So it uses a DW mult to calculate the product, and based on the op, operation operating code, if it's zero, the output is A plus B. If it is one, then the output is the product. Right. So. So to implement it, it needs one one multiplier that is instantiated explicitly, and one adder. Right. So let's look at now. So this is the adder. So U hundred was in the it comes from the RTL, but this one is chosen by DC. A data, B data, carrying. So this is a type of adder that is VW zero one underscore add. VW zero two underscore mult is uh, is our own very own RTL instance. So this is the way it chooses, right? So it it sees a plus sign, it will find out a DW component and use based on a design constraint, right? You can we can we can look inside these modules what they contain. It won't be Much of a use because uh, again these implementations are not easy to understand. So this is the multiply module. It's a big module. It has lot of combination logic, adders, and so on. It's difficult to understand. It's not possible to understand from this netlist what kind of architecture it is. Right? So, but uh, rest assured that these architectures are well documented in the. Although exact code is not given in the document, but. Uh, Uh, the document does tell you that it is good for area or good for timing or what is how does area compare or performance compare across these things, right? Let's look at uh, module adder eight. So adder eight, uh, yeah. So now we I also talk about this. So now module adder eight, I come to why it's zero or one. So module adder eight. Contains a DB of Lina, which performs the actual addition. So this module, this is the module DB of E. Let's add this module DB of E. Now this is the one that performs addition. Right? It's again this is this is just a combination of two numbers, which was expected, right? So if you add three things, uh, three bits, it needs a full adder. So this is a full adder. Now the way these full adders are connected. Will define whether it's the number of the full adders and the way they are connected. Will define whether it's area optimized or time optimized. In this case, we saw from the report, the source field report, that it's area optimized. So, uh, moral of the story: uh, report resources command uses to know what are the resources that DC will use in your design. You can use a generic multiplier statement by you can just use a multiplication sign or You could directly use a designer component up to the application, or but let's assure that for every 
plus minus multiply sign by DPC, it will try and find a suitable DW implementation for you. If you have, if only if you have a DW designer license for Right. Now let's come to <laughs> the mystery of uh, the module name of Adam. Now let's look at the design hierarchy first. Now we see that there are multiple instances of adder rate. In cascade mod, there are two adder rates. This is a case of unification. Now what DC does is that it by default we did not specify anything, just give a compile command, it will unify. It will make different copies of the design. So when we open this design, we check what all what all are the adders. Let's look at the non design Now let's look at the modules here. List of modules, adder 16. So see, the adder 16, the module name is preserved because there is only one instance of adder 16. So adder 16 is used only once. Adder 8 is the only design that is used multiple times. Comparator is also used multiple times. Comparator here and comparator here. So module adder, uh, let me just grep. So these are the list of modules. Module adder 16, module, now adder 8 has two modules. 8 underscore 0, 8 underscore 1. Now, in the net list that means has two different designs, adder 8 underscore 0, adder 8 underscore 1. Although in RTL the module name of same, but when it comes to net list, it will make in independent copies. Now, when, when the design synthesized, adder 8 0 has nothing to do with adder 8 1. Although the functionality is same, but the implementation might be entirely different. Because each of them will get optimized according to its own design goal. Okay. Similarly, comparator 1 and comparator 0, right. This what has, what name gets used after underscore is can again be controlled by a variable in DC shell, uh, just like the chain names can be controlled. Similarly, we all these things can be controlled. You want any specific uh, prefix to be present or specific suffix to be present, you can even control that the variable. Right. So, uh, so we saw the report resources command, it's very useful to know what are resources are there. We discussed about the uh, unification process. Now let me <coughs> show you one more command which is important for, for synthesis. It's called set fix multiple ports net. So, uh, what this command does is that now in, in the logical that RTL is logical in right? It's not physical in the sense that uh, you are only worried about the connectivity of data. You are not worried about physical rules. So many times, in, so when when it gets synthesized, let's say now uh, an input you have assigned output is equal to some input. So when it goes to uh, through synthesis, DC will not do anything special on it. It will just connect output to input, right? But when it goes to physical design, usually in physical design, many times these kind of issue, these kind of assigned statements will create issues. So always you want that there should be a buffer separating output, and at least a buffer, and then. Uh, according to design rules, there will be the more buffers or buffer will be upside or so. so. So, also you might have a case of one uh, register driving multiple outputs. So, in that case, the loading uh, is probably increased on the register, but DC will solve it only to the extent of meeting the mass capacitance on that register output. On output. But when it goes to backend, uh, physical design, it might happen that all those outputs are not placed close together. The ports are placed far far away from each other. In that case, you want a good buffer tree on the resistor output. So DC, what you are telling DC by this command is that you fix all such cases. So uh, you could read more about uh, it in the man page. 
so it will uh, it will apply some attribute called fix multiple port name it will insert buffers to isolate input from output ports it will insert buffers so that no cell drives in drives more than one output port and so on so this is just to make the job of the backend engineer easier logically it's same it doesn't change the functionality of the design so so uh, ideally before writing out the netlist uh, before compiling you set this you use this command Again, when you compile, before writing out the netlist, make sure you use the table command. So all these things are to make the uh, physical implementation, the uh, physical design, to be smooth. Right? Okay. Now this command is also done. Let's uh, now let's look at <laughs> we we saw uh, different options in compiler. Right? So we have been using no auto ungroup. Uh, we have discussed about this. You can read about most no sequential output inversion. Is that it, it inverts the sequential output in some cases where it finds that it can optimize the design better. Otherwise, what happens uh, if this happens? Sequential output. It, it means that yes. So now let's say there's a flaw, right? It drives a, a cone of logic. If DC finds that if I can invert this output of this flaw. Then my logic will be better optimized. If you don't give this, it will optimize that. It will do that, and it will invert again the input. So, uh, in now the flops, some many times you do not want that. When we come to formal equivalence, I'll tell you why you do not want that. So, ideally, to start with, you do not want to invert the output of the sequential element. So, you should always most most of the cases you should use this. Uh, as you, you can read about exact math, but I don't use it for that. Uh, boundary optimization, we have discussed that it can move inverters across boundaries. Usually, to start with, again, you don't want to do this, but you can do this later when you are somewhat comfortable with the compile command. You can, uh, we will talk about this later. I will talk about this in the lecture slides, not in the lab. Again, I will talk about this in the, in the lecture slides. We can incremental, we have talked about it. Again, you can split your compile into two. Incremental or uh, sorry, into no design rule and only design rule. Uh, but you, uh, but in most of the cases, you can you do not need to give any of this. It is design. Rule. Then there is an option for scan. Gate clock also I will discuss first in the lecture slide and then I will have a lab of it. Scan is simple. When you do scan, I have done a compiled scan. Let's see how, how it looks like. Uh, let's first look at the non-scan one. No IO delays dot B. Let's look at one of the flops. So this DFX has just these are DFX, these are non-scan flops. It has data, clock, and key. Let's look at the uh, file with scan. Now here the DFX are replaced by SDFX. So it will just replace all these flops. Which are non-scan by the scannable version. So DFF is replaced by SDFF, which means scan DFF. It has extra pin called SI and SI. SI is scannable. SI is scannable. When scannable is zero, B will go to Q. When scannable is one, SI will go to Q. Since it is just a replacement of B flip flop by a scan flip flop, DC. It does not stitch any scan chain. It will just convert the flop. Scan chain is not stitched, so all the scannable pins SE are type to zero, or the scan input pins SI are type to zero. So this is the default behavior when you give minus scan. Of course, you could use any DFT tool. You can also use the DFT compiler, which is a feature of the line compiler to scan. We might discuss it as a type of it. So, okay. so this is what scan then. So this was uh, we have covered most of the options of compile ultra. Now let me take uh, let me uh, talk about uh, virtual clocks and how to constrain the completely combination one. Right? <laughs> let me go to design decision and I will uh, remove all the design. Let's look at the RTL of a comparator. So comparator is a very very simple. 
uh, you cannot have a much simpler model uh, on RTL. It just gives it has a one bit output. If A in is less than B in, it will report one, otherwise it will report zero. Right. RTL is very very simple, let me still not be because the comparison is between 16 bits of A in to 16 bits of B in. I believe you have already know what a hardware looks like. So let us see what DC does, right. Now this is now uh, let us say you are given a task of synthesizing a component or a module such as this. It looks very simple, but now let us let us read it, right. Uh, let us read this design and like uh, or what I would do is there is only single module, I will say read very long, there is a command called read very long. And I'll just it will do the reading, analyzing, and elaborating both. There is no nothing special in comparator. So, very good. So it it analyzes and it elaborates also. Now what I do is now I have to compile it. Now what is my first instinct? I look at the ports. I say all ports, all inputs. These are all inputs and let's look at all outputs. This is the output. There is no clock in place. How do I constrain it? Let's not constrain it. Let's just do a compile. Compile like that. Now all the all the options there's no need. There's no need of auto ungroup, there's no need of no sequential output inversion, there's no need of giving uh, no boundary optimization because there is no hierarchy. It's just one module. So we can just give compile ultra and see what happens. So, there is no uh, there is no timing violation, this column represents timing violation, there is nothing, area is 90.7, so it will optimize for area, right. Uh, so, uh, it will optimize for area, design will be slow, whatever. The area is 90.7 and so on, let us uh, write out a very long, from dot V, there is no need to make a because there is just one value. So let us now look at from dot Now, is it simple? No, it is not simple. It has a lot of comparison, right? It has a lot of and or OA gates, and so this is the network. Now, I want to constrain it. Now, this comparator, you know that. Your manager tells you, your design team tells you that this comparator will sit between two slots, but those slots are not part of your design. Those slots are uh, one is at the input side, so the A and B are coming from from, from slots. C out is going to another slot. Now, the, and that works at 500 megahertz. What should I do? How should I constrain it? So there are two two ways of doing it. One first is very simple. Now let's say you are given to synthesize this and make sure that it meets a 500 megahertz clock and there is no clock here. What I would do is I would assume that <laughs> there is a valid assumption that the clocks which are lying on the either side of this comparator there is no other combination logic to it that means the clock is launching the data and clock is capturing the data. So, out of the complete period of uh, 2 nanoseconds, which represents the 500 megahertz clock, out of that complete 2 nanoseconds, maybe I could take 1.5 nanoseconds. Valid assumption because it is uh, there is no other combination logic in picture. So, what I would do is the command I would use is called set max delay. I say set max delay minus from all inputs to all outputs. This is the command I can use and the value I can give let us say is 1.5 what I estimate right. I tell DC that all the paths <laughs> I mean they start from any input of the design and I go to the output each path should be not more than each time path should not be more than 1.5 milliseconds. Now, let us do a compile again. Is the area more? Yes. Why? Because now it is trying to optimize the time, right. 
Now let's look at report time. Report timing. Now see, starts input delay zero. That don't doesn't matter. We have it up now. It launches A at zero, goes through all these elements and simply out. And the max delay is one point five. So it goes from input, goes to output. Total time is point nine nine. Max delay constraint was one point five. So it tells us that it is met by one five one. All the paths are constrained. You could actually check by using report constraint minus one value. Design has no value. It's constrained. We are good. Your design manager is happy. You were able to do this. Now there is second second way of doing it. Now you know that you already know that the clock is 500 megahertz. What I would do now is that first I would clean up the constraint. It's a very simple command to clean up the constraint. We know that report remove design, remove the design. But what if I want to keep the design but remove the constraints? I say reset underscore design. It will remove all the constraints. Right? The only constraint we have applied here is just the master. Now I create the that clock. Fine. The clock is not part of my design, but I can still create it right? by using a concept called virtual clock. I say create clock minus p z two. I create a 500 megahertz clock. I know lies outside of my design. I say create clock minus p z two minus name. Let's say clock. It gives me a warning that it is creating a virtual clock with the name clock with no sources, which is fine. I know that. I expect that, right? Now I would say I can set input delay. Now again. Let's say I want a point five. So again, now here I was wanting a, I wanted a max delay of one point five. Fine. What I would do now, I would set input delay of zero on with respect to clock. Input delay is always with respect to some clock, with respect to clock clock, and on all the inputs. Then I would set an output delay of 0.5 minus clock on outputs. Now see, input delay is something you are giving to the external world. Output delay is also something you are giving to the external world. Now consider a fully combination path. So, how do you decide input output delay? <coughs> the sum of input output delay. Should be subtracted from the period, and the time left is the one that you would be using. Let's go the other way around. I know that I need 1.5 milliseconds for my design. I am left with 0.5 ns. So the 0.5 ns is equal to input delay plus output delay. So I chose input delay to be zero, output delay to be 0.5. We can choose the other way around. We can also choose 0.25 input delay, 0.25 output delay. Doesn't matter. For combination design, for this kind of design, so the sum. So I by specifying this command, uh, let's see what happens. Again, I do a compile. So the area is very similar, probably exactly the same. And now I do a report time. Again, you see the results are exactly same. Doesn't change. Input delay zero. What we applied? Output delay point five. The clock, right? This is the way you use virtual clock to specify to constrain combination paths. Virtual clock has so many other uses as well. So first of all, virtual. Why did you create virtual clock? Virtual clock is created only because you want to specify some input delay or output delay with respect to this clock, and you want to mimic the conditions that are there in the external world. Which is superior, max delay or virtual clock? There is no verdict like that. One is one is superior than other, but. Virtual clock is used very very extensively in packet timing analysis. There are so many other uses to it. So for specs for constraining your combination logic specifically, the combination logic might also exist as part of a bigger design. So in the in the complete design, uh, we saw that there were paths directly from input to output. There were cases like that. So these are the cases where 
starting from input there are there is a lot of combination logic directly going to the output. So you can constrain this type of design, this type of combination logic by using either max delay or by using a virtual clone. Whatever you want to use is up to you. But we will see the power of virtual clock in unit time. Virtual clocks are much more sophisticated than than the max delay, and uh, we see we will see that how what all uses uh, what all uh, powerful things we could do with virtual clock. Right? So please uh, please spend some time in reading about the uh, the max delay command. What it does, you could try out. So in this, this design, in this. Uh, the chip level design which uh, I have the appeal for, uh, it is good in the sense that it is a simple design, you could make modifications to it according to your, your needs, uh, according to your, you should try and make this design better in terms of time, right. Area wise do not be concerned much, you cannot do much, uh, it is dependent on the style of size and dependent on the kind of design you have. Design is very very simple, but you should try and make modifications to it. So that you can constrain it better and make sure that there are no timing errors. It can be achieved very, very easily, right? You just have to make sure that inputs are registered, outputs are registered. You should have some kind of uh, uh, timing constraint, good timing constraints for inputs and outputs. Try and synthesize the design for 500 megahertz and make sure that all the paths uh, It would be a very, very good assignment to have. Okay? So, next uh, lab. Uh, I want. I'll, I would probably have uh, one or two sessions on power, and in one of the labs, I'll focus on the clock gating option of compile ultra and on power in general. Thank you.